This episode brought to you by Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. I don't know, I guess I'm on Jim Carrey kick for some reason. Released in 1997, Liar Liar really was the perfect premise with the perfect people at the perfect time. A comedy about a lawyer who can't lie for a day with Jim Carrey and the director of The Night Professor right after the disappointment of The Cable Guy. Now I've gone on record saying I think the reaction to The Cable Guy was a little odd when it came out. I think people have opened up to it after the internet has shown there's a lot of people like this out there, and for some reason people thought this one underperforming movie, yeah, underperforming, didn't even bomb, was the end of Jim Carrey's career. It was a little strange. But with that said, Liar Liar put Carrey back on top. The film was Universal's second biggest three-day opening, causing Carrey, who was presenting at the Oscars that week, to open up by asking, And how was your weekend? <laughs> While the premise is a funny one, it could have gotten really old really fast, but a very well-written script mixed with Carrie's boundless energy gave the film the perfect mix of surprises, laughs, and even a bit of heart. So let's go back and see why this film was such a favorite then and continues to be a favorite now. This is Liar! Liar! It's not a subtle movie. As the credits roll, we open this 90s PG-13 comedy about a broken family the way every 90s PG-13 comedy about a broken family opens. After Mrs. Doubtfire. The goofy father having a clear problem resulting in a divorce with his kid still loving him, and way too whimsical music accompanying the whole thing. <laughs> Did somebody just free a fairy? Why was every comedy scored like somebody got accepted into Hogwarts? Jim Carrey plays Fletcher Reed, a great name for a lawyer or a detective turning into a used car salesman. And as you'd imagine, he doesn't have time for his son Max, played by Justin Cooper, to the dismay of his ex-wife Audrey, played by Maura Tierney. But when he does make time, he does make Max happy. A claw! Ah! <laughs> Nothing can stop the claw! <laughs> does the music think the claw's the main character and we're wrapping up his story? I'm already waiting for the end credits to run with the score. I ran out of gas. Rough neighborhood, too. Might have had to pull out my nine and bust a cat. With my mind on my money, on my money, on my mind. <laughs> In a year when movies were battling to be the whitest, that might have been the whitest moment. <laughs> oh, spoke too soon. Carrie always plays Audrey's current love interest, Jerry, who's a perfect innocent foil to Fletcher. Maybe we can stop at the park on the way home and play catch. Hey, great gift, Dad! Thanks, son. As much as I've made fun of the British accent Elwes can't quite cover up, I feel like it really adds to the innocently naive attitude this character has. I feel like any second he's gonna lead a Mormon Boy Scout troop in Neverland. <laughs> Hi, honey. Hi. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was a nice image. Deleted. And then there's Carrie's performance. Overactor. Yes, obviously, that's one of the reasons we all go to see him. We want to see him react big when he can't lie, and he does all that great. And we want to believe this is a guy who not only could be a lawyer, but would also have the personality that lends itself to breakdowns like this. And that works about half the time. He certainly has the cynical joy of being good at what he does, no matter who it hurts. And it's believable he would pass on that joy and silliness when playing with his son. But sometimes, he is just Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey. You guys aren't, you know... <sighs> I think the comedy works better when I believe him as a character, and that would involve holding back a touch on some of these reactions. No, not too much, again, we want to buy him as an energetic sleazeball getting his comeuppance, but Saul Goodman is a silly lawyer who feels like he's making jokes for himself. This is a silly lawyer who feels like he's making jokes for the audience. And that can be a little distracting. But like I said though, I don't think it works about half the time before he gets the curse. He varies it enough that a lot of his little quips do get some big laughs. One, two, three, four, five, and one for good luck. He struck the child, did you see that? I also like they don't make Jerry the villain. Maybe another borrowed element from Mrs. Doubtfire where they help back making Brosnan the villain. Hell, am I a bad three for one deal when they got Mrs. Selner. With that said, the supporting cast does good giving Carrie the grounded support he needs while still being memorable. Nobody feels out of place or forgettable in this. 
Even Max is always on the cusp of being too blandly cute, but he pulls off just enough believability to feel like a real kid. Will sitting too close to the TV set make me go blind? Not in a million years. Aha! Uh -huh. I knew blue light glasses were just a way for the government to get microchips inside our... But I don't know, I'm not good at conspiracy theories. On that note, Fletcher lets things go too far when he has to cancel two meetups with Max, one of them being his birthday party. He takes the time instead to sleep with his business partner Miranda, played by Amanda Donahoe. As you'd imagine, Max makes a wish that for one day, Fletcher can't tell a lie. And it instantly comes true. Is it good for you? I've had better. From this point on, Carrie does almost every take perfectly. <laughs> He has to go from being shocked why the hell he can't lie, to trying to stop and failing miserably, to trying to find ways around it, to just accepting that his life is over because of it. It's a perfect excuse for him to go as big as he normally does. Though weirdly, this might be one of the few times where a trailer does a joke a little funnier. In the elevator, he keeps talking about this woman's breasts, again unable to stop himself, and even though I'm not the biggest fan of censorship, the cut in the trailer I think works better. Everybody's been real nice. That's because you have big jugs. I mean, your boobs are huge. Mama! Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big... And I get it, you have to see the movie to see what he says. That's one of the reasons you go see it, but... I think imagining what he said is a little funnier, and I'm sorry, that's an amazing edit. Well, that's because you have big... Who knows, maybe Wicker Man would have been funnier if they edited out that big punch. What is it? What's wrong, sister? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Jennifer Tilly plays the divorcee, trying to take her ex for all he's worth, on Fletcher's advice. And Jason Bernard plays the judge, trying to make sense of the oncoming insanity. Swoozie Kurtz is also great as the ex's attorney. Sometimes her facial reactions are just as good as Carrie's. On that note, I do think a lot of this scene depends on your threshold of silliness. What's your case? Like, I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> that's pretty stupid. <clears throat> that's really funny. <laughs> that's really stupid. But it all balances out when he gives a look like he just made the best argument ever. <sighs> That's how a lot of this first courtroom scene works. It's a little hit and miss, and I think he's jumping too big a little too quickly. It's 1.30 sharp. <laughs> but then the little touches, like him hinting at the court reporter not to type what he mutters, is pure gold. The Honorable Judge Marshall Stephen. Honorable. <laughs> he used to seeing a lot of that at the Trump trials. When he gets to his office, it gets crazy funny crazy fast as he tries to tell the simple lie of saying the pen is blue when it's red. The color of this pen is... <laughs> when he demands his hand to write it, his hand actually turns on him and literally spells the truth all over his face. I have no problem believing that hand is alive and pissed at Carrie. And I love wondering how this curse works where his hand is given a mind of its own. Stop it! I know that hand doesn't have eyes, but it has eyes. <laughs> Panicking, he tries to talk to Audrey, only to discover Jerry has asked her to move to Boston with him. And they're leaving that night. Yeah, did I mention a lot happens in this 24 hours? You can't move to Boston, I'll never see Max. Then you'll have pretty much the same relationship you have with him now, won't you? <laughs> That's a really good line. <laughs> Most of the movie has a good tempo from this point on. It's very rare a joke doesn't work. Carrie gives just the right reactions, going absolutely insane while having to answer absolutely any question asked of him, even if it's rhetorical. What's your problem, schmuck? I'm an inconsiderate prick! Even the music I was kind of mocking earlier adds a playful energy that elevates the more hyper moments. Also, I feel like this moment sums up why there's a lot of big lawsuits in America, but not quite as many small lawsuits as you would think. If I take you to small claims court, it'll just drain eight hours out of my life, and you probably won't show up, and if I finally got the judgment, you'd just stiff me anyway! But God help you if I find a faded kabuki mask under a bridge! The heartfelt scenes also really work. When Fletcher explains his absence, realizing he's incapable of making up any more excuses, he tells the truth to himself, as well as to Audrey. I'm a bad father! I mean... That's not a bad little bit of dramatic acting. It doesn't have to be over-explained, it's all gotten across with just the emotion on his face. 
It would have been so easy for Carrie to Majestic get up and play that bigger, but he finds just the right balance there. Enough to make up for this weird line when he promises to show up tonight or her and Max are going to Boston. If I don't show up, I'll pack you myself. I will lovingly wrap your knickknacks with bubble paper. I hope so. Wait, which part? That line really should have been reworked. <laughs> Before she goes, she reveals what Max wished for, causing Fletcher to finally put two and two together. Oh my god, that's it! Small claims court won't work, so I'll have to go after the government! That's a celebrity, that's what I'm used to doing. Oh yeah, it's that time of year when we look at fall all kinda creepily obsessed. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. And when I say jam, I mean apple spice jam. <gasps> oh, apples, what do you do to me around the fall season? Luckily, Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Not like the unhealthy way you look at fall. Oh, look at that foliage. It's stripping down to the floor. Oh, my goodness, goodness. Too busy this fall to cook, but want to make sure you're eating well? Well, with Factor, skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too. While you're still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you need. Oh, those leaves are as orangey hot as a pumpkin latte on fire. Is that nutmeg caressing my senses. No, it's cinnamon nutmeg. Ah! Factors fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and enjoy, then get back to crushing your goals. Like crushing those crispy leaves with your feet that just make you go... <laughs> Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. Oh, that's so responsible! If you like fall in a creepy way or just a normal way, head to factormeals.com slash nostalgia50 and use the code nostalgia50 to get 50% off. That's code nostalgia50 at factormeals.com slash nostalgia50 to get 50% off. <gasps> Do I smell kitschy house decor? No. It's quite a coincidence though. Plays God of War for the first time every Friday on Twitch. We also have content five days a week. Hope to see you there. Fletcher visits Max in school. I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Dude, the kid's eight. Shouldn't he be horrified by Roe Dahl by this point? Or is that like the only book not banned now? And he admits to Max his wish came true and he can't lie. If I keep making this face, Will it get stuck that way? Uh-uh. In fact, some people make a good living that way. See what you did there? I love even when he's trying to teach Max the importance of lying, he still comes across as a dick. Some of these fast throwaway lines are really funny. <laughs> when your mommy was pregnant with you, she gained a good 40 pounds. Daddy was scared. My teacher tells me real beauty's on the inside. That's just something ugly people say. I do miss 90s writing sometimes. In an honestly clever move, Fletcher tries to recreate the wish with a birthday cake and everything, trying to make Max undo his wish. By the way, what is Carrie doing here? Yeah, I just need a little test. Nope, my nipples still don't produce milk. One day science will catch up to my fetish. The wish doesn't work, though, because Max admits he didn't mean it, as when his dad lies, it always makes him feel bad. Realizing he's not getting anywhere, Fletcher goes back to the office. Yo, Fletcher, how's it going? Sure, shriveled and always to the left. I'll stop reading Miranda's Yelp review of you. And Haney plays his assistant Greta, bringing the same charm she does to basically any role she's in. Ask me something you think I would normally lie about. Remember a couple of months ago when I wanted a raise? Forget it. I don't want to do this. She goes from supporting Fletcher to leaving him after she learns the truth about his raise, and every step feels believable because of how well she plays it. Also, I think this is the funniest line delivery out of Carrie. You bought me this antique silver frame from Tiffany's. Tiffany's. Gosh, I'll 650 mark down from 10. He looks like James Dean shitting out Mickey Mouse. I love it. Oh, God in heaven! 
Miranda hears of Fletcher's inability to lie and brings him to a board meeting with the boss he knows he hates. He's a pedantic, pontificating, pretentious bastard. But of course the boss loves his insults because the scene is unbelievably forced. That's the funniest damn thing I've ever heard! You're a real card, Reed! Yeah, I personally don't think it's that funny. You could cut this character out of the film and really miss nothing important. The only bit I like is Fletcher laughing in Miranda's face and him passing out. Though I don't know, watching more stuff about higher-ups, maybe this reaction isn't so far-fetched. It gets back to the great stuff, though, when Fletcher has to defend a woman who's had an affair seven times and one of them is caught on tape. I swear Tilly's voice literally becomes a goose at one point. <laughs> You get the rocks off for Boris from Balto, man! A goose! Fletcher asks for a short bathroom break where he thinks of a plan to beat the shit out of himself. This leads to one of the cleverest non-lies of the film. Who did this? A madman, your honor! A desperate fool at the end of his pitiful rope! A man who thought penguins was a good career choice! When the judge asks if he can continue, though, he of course has to say yes, and the trial is back on. When the man the tape is called in as a witness, Fletcher realizes he can't complete the question if he knows the answer is going to be false. So all we gotta do is lie. That sounds simple enough. Doesn't it? It's as easy as not making a cartoon out of my movies, which at the time was trickier than it sounds. He takes the stand and things immediately start to go wrong. Isn't it true that your relationship with my client is entirely platonic? I object, your honor! Ah, oh, glad we got Amber Heard's defense team on the case. This whole scene is comedy gold, from all the different ways Fletcher describes sex. You slammed her, you ducked her donut, you gave her dog a sausage! To stating the obvious, but still hilarious. He's badgering the witness. It's his witness. And did I say that garage sale line was Carrie's funniest moment? Then this facial reaction when he gets the witness to destroy his case is a photo finish. Hey, I hooked her brains up! There! Now you happy? It's that little smirk he has for a moment, like even he realizes how funny this all is, but gets dragged back to reality when he puts together, his career is over. Also, Jason Bernard's line read here is so perfect. Do I dare ask you to call your next witness? I truly believe this movie wouldn't have worked half as good as it did if the supporting cast wasn't as top-notch as it is. I am not going to end up as 31-year-old divorcee on welfare because my scumbag attorney had a sudden attack of conscience. When Fletcher discovers his client's real age, though, it turns out she lied about it to get married, which made her a minor. She was only 17 when she got married, and in the great state of California, no minor can enter into any legal contract without parental consent. That makes the affairs irrelevant and... Technically, the ex-husband, uh, it's best not to think too hard about it. I didn't know she was underage. The case is a success, but Fletcher's client wants custody of the kids too, despite the ex-husband clearly being the better parent. She does this inspired by what Fletcher said earlier. God's sake, will you give me those? They're mine. Let go of daddy. Let go of him. Don't you have some checks to write? Get kind of funny in a movie that tries to give every happy ending possible. This family is basically destroyed because of Fletcher. On the one hand, I like not everything is wrapped up in a perfect package, but it almost is, so this does feel a little out of place. This man is a good father, and children are not leverage! Fletcher makes a big scene out of what he's done, resulting in him getting thrown in jail, once again missing his meetup with Max. Also, am I crazy, or is that the guy who broke out in the opening? Judging by the trailer, I think he had a bigger role in this. Greta! Have you been sexually molested yet? Because I could circle the block. This movie's a bit eewier than I remember. She bails him out after hearing about his change of heart, and he rushes to stop his family from going to Boston. I love my son! I love my son! Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter! Merry Christmas, family! I'm emotionally and financially crippled! Merry Christmas, exact scene! I'll do 12 years later! Ooh, just in time for my favorite karaoke scene in the movie. I have something for you, young man. It's the claw! Ooh, you're scared of the claw. You're scared of the claw. <laughs> Maybe not even my favorite Elway scene in the movie, maybe just my favorite of all time. <laughs> Fletcher sneaks his way through pre-9-11 security in a moment that everyone asks, no, really, how did he fit in that bag? And I think the answer is, he can just do that. And he finds the plane with his son on board. God, it's Fletcher. No, no, this has nothing no, no, to no, do no, with no, Fletcher. It's Fletcher. What? <gasps> the family flying from Camp Chippewa had a similar experience. He distracts the pilot stopping the plane, does... I think every John Leguizamo impression from the past. Ah!
And despite going to prison, it looks like he finally convinced his family he loves them. He's telling the truth, Mom. He's not allowed to lie. It's 8.45. So you heard? No, it was the truth. I like he tells them after the curse wears off, so they have to trust he's changed just by his word. And cut to a mere one year later. No, really. How isn't he in prison after all this? Showing up on time to his son's birthday. Late at night. With his friends all gone. You sure he didn't show up late to this too? Let's make a wish. Ah! Our son might be the Antichrist. We should probably set down some ground rules. Audrey and Fletcher immediately get back together. Clearly not a holdover from Mrs. Doubtfire. And Max admits he didn't wish for that, but rather for rollerblades. Oh, and an adorably cheesy ending. No one can stop the clock! <laughs> Liar, liar. At times, corny and over the top, but I think it's what most of us were looking for. <laughs> Had it just been big reactions and family sitcom moments, the movie wouldn't have worked. But the writing is incredibly funny, with a lot of great one-liners, and the acting is all memorable and on point. Any moments that don't work don't really ruin anything, which is impressive for a film that's trying to go so over the top, yet also be so sentimental. Carrie's energy stops what should be a one-note joke from getting old. And the inventiveness in the different problems he encounters, as well as the solutions he comes up with, result in a pretty decent comedy. It's a lot of fun, with a lot of laughs, and just the right amount of 90s cheese. Insert, and that's no lie, joke here. With Family Matters closing credits. I'm a nostalgic guy, remember? So you don't have to. Oh, you're scared of a claw. You're scared of the claw. This month, for cameos for charity, we're doing Red Cross. We've been seeing a lot of disasters in nature recently, and Red Cross specializes in trying to help any way they can. Whether it's providing blood, sending in volunteers, helping near or far with disasters big or small, Red Cross provides a number of different ways to save lives. So if you want a cameo of me saying happy birthday or good luck or whatever, click on the link below and be giving to a good cause. Or if you're like, screw you, I can't even look at you, well, consider giving to this organization anyway. You can give money, give blood, or even volunteer. They're amazing people that literally save lives and you can help them out. Click on the link and see if this is a cause you can give to.